Hi, in this video um, I want to talk a little bit about one of my favourite writers that I really don't think gets any attention, um, not only just here on YouTube but um, more generally. He's one of those writers that seems to have kind of fallen out of fashion or kind of um, just you know, nobody really talks about him anymore. I mean, I, I'm, I'm talking about Laurie Lee, um, who's an English writer who grew up in Stroud in Gloucestershire um, in the fairly early 1900s um, and who went travelling to Spain in 1935 and was kind of transformed by the experience and then um, he returned to England, then he went back to Spain and decided to fight in the Civil War because he was um, so moved by his experiences and uh, his, I think, political activity was kind of cut short because uh, he had epilepsy and um, that of course made you know fighting and things like that quite quite difficult. I mean traveling quite difficult. Um, so um, you know he kind of returned to England I think you know, developed this lifelong um, enamoration with Spain and its culture and its people and music and um, you know he kind of spent his whole life retelling uh, his experiences from Spain and remembering uh, things that stayed with him his whole life and I'm not really sure how I came to get into Laurie Lee. Um, I think I saw a documentary probably on YouTube um, which probably was a very old uh, English documentary about about him and that's kind of how I got interested in him because I, I kind of went through a stage where um, travel writing really interests me particularly about the Spanish and Hispanic world and um, what I really love about Laurie Lee is his style of writing, which again I'm told is kind of out of fashion, um, but I don't really understand why. Um, he's, he considers himself to be a poet, but his um, travel writing is more kind of prose poetry in style. Um, and he's more famous for his first book, uh, Cider with Rosie, which is I suppose, you know, what's the technical term, like a kind of coming of age tale, you know, about um, his adolescence in Gloucestershire and um, his, you know, becoming a man, <laughs> can we call it that? Um, it's probably not um, politically correct for me to say that, I'm not sure. Um, it's about him, yeah, growing up and things like that. And then I think uh, all of his work really is kind of narrative nonfiction or poetry about um, his autobiographical experiences. In fact, I wanted to share with you um, something from uh, this book by Laurie Lee, which is called um, I Can't Stay Long. I'm not sure if you can actually see. Can you see it from here? I think maybe you can see it better from here. That's actually Laurie Lee there. It's quite a handsome, kind of real looking, sort of chappy, um, you know, uh, he's sitting in his, uh, you know, rural bliss. Um, so uh, this is what Laurie Lee uh, said about uh, writing autobiography. Um, we're on page 36 here. He says, autobiography can be the laying to rest of ghosts as well as an ordering of the mind. But for me, it is also a celebration of living and an attempt to hoard its sensations. In common with other writers, I have written little that was not for the most part autobiographical. The spur for me is the fear of evaporation, erosion, amnesia if you like, the fear that a whole decade may drift gently away and leave nothing but a salt caked mud flat. A wasting memory is not only a destroyer, it can destroy one's very existence. A day unremembered is like a soul unborn, worse than if it had never been. What indeed was that summer, if it is not recalled? That journey, that act of love, to whom did it happen if it has left you with nothing? Certainly not to you. So any bits of warm life preserved by the pen are trophies snatched from the dark, are branches of leaves fished out of the flood, are tiny arrests of mortality. The urge to write may also be the fear of death, particularly with autobiography. The need to leave messages for those who come after saying, I was here, I saw it too. So I think that, you know, Laurie Lee was extremely aware that, um, of why, you know, why, or was extremely conscious of why we try to write autobiographically. Um, you know, because on the one hand, you can say autobiographical writing is 
potentially um, quite narcissistic, you know, just going on about your own experiences endlessly. Um, of course, if those experiences involve other people and I think we pay equal attention or details trying to understand, uh, you know, the experience of other people that came into contact with your life, then I think that autobiographical writing can escape uh, narcissism, <laughs> potentially, you know, not necessarily, but um, potentially. So um, after writing his first book, Cider with Rosie, which I mentioned was this kind of autobiographical telling of his adolescence, um, he wrote a book called um, As I Walked Out One Midsummer Morning. Again, can you see that? I hope you can see it. Please excuse the lack of uh, technical um, facility in these early YouTube videos. Let's hope that I manage to move beyond that. Um, and in As I Walked Out One Midsummer Morning, uh, he tells the story of how he walked out one midsummer morning, and basically, uh, it was 1935. Um, he, you know, it was just shortly before the, before the war, and uh, he was Second World War, and um, Laurie Lee lived at home in Stroud, and I, th I think he was kind of experiencing a bit of boredom. You know, it's like you know, he he'd loved where he came from, but he wanted to experience something else. But he came from a very humble home. He didn't have the financial luxury of being able to go travelling in, um, you know, kind of a luxurious way. So um, what he did was he he just walked out literally with his guitar and decided to busk his way uh, to Spain, and and that's what he did quite successfully. And um, you know, sung for his supper, <laughs> as we as we say in English. And um, when he returned he wrote again another autobiographical uh, piece of narrative non-fiction in which he describes um, his experiences in Spain. Um, what I particularly love is the prose poetry of his writing. Um, let me see if I can share. I mean, I mean you could really pick any page in this book and you, you will immediately find something uh, beautiful. Um, so here I've just picked a page at random. Um, between the mountains and the sea, the country was a dried up prairie, dun coloured, smoking with dust. Thin, wiry grass bent to the day long winds which covered them with ghostly foam of salt, while far away to the north one could see the black dots of bulls wandering over the plain like buffaloes. So, you know, as, as you can see, it's like he has this beautiful way of um, writing in this very poetic way about. Um, Spain and I particularly um, I mean I love I love everything about it I also love the way he he does dialogue um, let me see if I can find a, a piece of dialogue for you uh, here we go so um, late that night Manola returned having made his way back along the coast on foot he walked quietly into the bar like an apparition, his face drawn, his clothes dripping with seawater. El Gato, who had been drinking and dozing all evening, rose to his feet with a grunt and embraced him. They stood, the two leaders, the big and the small, holding on to each other stiffly. Where were you? asked El Gato. We didn't mean to leave you, man. We had to get out, you understand. Manolo nodded. I saw you go, he said. I buried myself. Isidro was lying just across the valley. He was still alive when they found him and they cut his throat. When it got quiet, I went to the sea. Is the bridge down? Yes, I swam to the faro. Then I came on over the cliff. What about the ships? You saw them. You saw what they did. Can we get back? Not with this gang. Never. So he has this incredible way of describing his interactions with, with Spanish people. Um, that have this, yeah, like very raw, rustic, rustic quality. I think probably because um, he came from a rural area in England, um, uh, he he kind of found odd similarities. I think, or, or they don't seem very odd to me, but perhaps to some people might seem odd, like the similarities between rural England and rural Spain. And um, given that I now live in a very rural area of Colombia. Sometimes I start to realise that there are, there are very peculiar similarities uh, between um, England and Colombia. Um, probably need to talk about that in a separate video. But I, so I can kind of understand why Laurie Lee 
um, had these particular fascinations with, with um, you know, the sort of slight difference and the odd similarity between Spain and England. Um, when he when he returned from his first trip to Spain, um, he was, I think, can you say radicalised, you know, like a bit politically awakened, shall we say, by um, the situation in Spain. And he actually decided to join the Republican International Brigades and, and went back to Spain. Um, and he documents that process in a, a third book, which is called A Moment of War. Um, so again, a, an extremely beautiful book. Um, there's a, oh yes, this is a nice picture inside of the Flurry Lee. It looks a little bit like a diagonalized photo. I don't think it is. I think it's actually part of his photo, which is even more beautiful. And um, he documents his experiences uh, in in the war. And um, I just wanted to finish by uh, sharing with you the the last part of the book. Sorry if that kind of spoils the ending for you, but. Um, you know, when he makes it back to England, basically, after his experiences in Spain. And um, because I think he describes quite beautifully the experiences of um, a person who has been politically active in a dangerous situation and um, has a loved one who is concerned about them. Um, and I think he depicts that quite beautifully here. So I'm going to finish by reading you that. At dawn the next day, I arrived at Victoria Station and saw the cloud of her breath where she waited. She looked at my hands, then my face, and gave her short jackal laugh. I sniffed the cold, misty fur of her hair. As we drove north, she watched me as much as she watched the road. Well, I hope you're pleased with yourself, she said. Didn't give me a thought, did you? I've been through absolute hell. You know that. I even went to a call box one night, a public phone box. Can you imagine? And I got right through to Socorro Rojo, Albacete. Just think, across France and those frontiers and all Spain and that war. It took me three hours and I was crying all the time. I just wanted to talk to you. Talk to you. Can you understand? A man was watching me from a car and kept giving me money for the phone. No wonder you look so smug. Then I was back in her flat, in high, wealthy Hampstead. She drew me in with her blue, steady gaze. I remember the flowers on the piano, the white sheets on her bed, her deep mouth, and love without honour.